Hello and welcome to episode 99 of the official EstablishTheRun.com podcast. My name is Adam Levitan. I'm one of the co-founders here at ETR and it is final exam time. Week one is just two short weeks away. So it is time for us to plant the flag on our guys. For that, I, of course, I am joined by the man who is the market. It is fellow co-founder Evan Silva. Evan, what's going on? A lot is going on. A lot is going on. We had the David Montgomery injury. Letting the Tariq Cohen truthers off the hook. Leone is just holding a dance party at his home right now as we speak. And um, But no, this podcast that we're about to do is, I think, one of our most actionable of the entire year. We've been getting a lot of requests for really weeks at this point about this specific podcast. And it's a fun one to do. We had a lot of success with the guys that we chose uh, for this podcast last year. And I expect to have similar success in 2020. Yeah, I hope people go back and listen to last year's. I actually haven't, uh, but I, 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 I would hope at least that it was Eckler, it was Godwin, it was Lamar, it was, I, I hope. So go back and listen to that. You can hold our feet to the fire and, and send us clips of where we messed up or whatever. But yeah, on today's pod, as Evan mentioned, we're going to do a simple exercise. We're just going to go round by round and talk through our favorite players in each round. Simple as that. Um, Evan mentioned all the news going on. The good thing about our draft kit is that we are constantly updating it to reflect all this news, all the rankings, all the tiers, everything is getting updated to reflect all the news and all everything that we know currently so you can be ready for your draft. It is just $35. Our draft kit is contains everything you need to win your draft. I think a lot of our opponents have probably fallen behind in research in this unique offseason. Uh, we've been putting our hearts and soul into this draft kit for the last five months. Furthermore, most of you guys know that my favorite form of fantasy and where I spend 95% of my time is in DFS. Our in-season package contains plenty of season-long content, a lot of it. But I also think that Evan and myself and Drew and Leone and Wiggins and Taylor, some of the highest stakes, most successful DFS players in the game, the in-season package contains everything we think you need to win in DFS. So we have the bundle package up now, packages that up the draft kit. The in season for the lowest price you will find all year. If you want, if you already have the draft kit and want to upgrade to bundle, just shoot us an email at support. Okay, let's get to it. Keep in mind here, we are very loosely basing this on underdog ADP, but what we're really trying to replicate is a home league. Like, you know, you guys are drafting with your buddies on Yahoo with ESPN, and the ADP we know is really, really soft. You can read my articles about abusing the default rankings on the site and how we can gain leverage by these really soft rankings and people relying on them. This these rounds are not for like true best ball grinders and high stakes online leagues. We've covered all that over the last few months. So we're going to go round by round here with kind of loose home league ADP. Just talk about our favorite guys in round one. Evan, let's kick it off. Where would you prefer? And obviously round one is going to depend on where you what slot you draw. Where would you prefer to draft at this point, Evan? And who would you take? Either 101 or toward the very, very back end. But in this particular circumstance, I put as my primary target at, at the 101, obviously Christian McCaffrey. I would prefer, I think if you gave me any selection in the first round, I would take 101. And I, would, and I understand that the 2-3 turn is rough. It can be very, very rough. Um, but Christian McCaffrey, I think, gives you such a significant edge. Again, scored nine more fantasy points per game in PPR than any other running back in fantasy football last year. And I think that he's going to be similarly productive this year. So he would be my number one target. I did come with a backup target, though. Mm -hmm. Not a player that deserves to go toward the end of the first round. Is a player that you can get in the middle of the first round. And that is Derrick Henry. Because I think that he's going to set a career high in receptions. Um, I love his schedule, according to Warren Sharp's strength of schedule, based on opponent win totals. The Titans have the second easiest schedule in the league this year. That bodes really well for his game script. I don't trust Darian, Darrington Evans as a third-round pick out of Appalachian State to earn a very, very big role in his first season. Um, and so I think that Derrick Henry is going to play in passing situations a little bit more. And if we could just get him to 30, 35 catches, I think that would be a great compliment to what I think we're going to get from him uh, as a rusher and I like the Titans this year. I like their, the over on their win total at eight and a half. Um, I think they're going to be a rock solid team once again. Yeah, I bet the Titans uh, to win the AFC South. I think they got around plus 175, plus 180 
a while back and it's crazy you know I, people probably know that i have been uh, last year uh showed some trepidation on derrick henry at the dfs level due to non-game flow independence due to lack of a passing role but in these kind of half ppr formats that a lot of people are playing in i think derrick henry is an awesome target too i would actually right now take him above uh dalvin cook i would take him above clyde edwards hilaire it's just set up so well the, it, it's not many guys whose literally entire offensive scheme is built around one player and their entire offensive scheme is built around derrick henry no better bet to lead the league in touchdowns no better bet to have 300 uh, carries. Uh, if I didn't get McCaffrey, if I didn't get the big dog, the target for me would be Miles Sanders. And I know he has this lower body injury right now. I thought they'd sign a veteran all off season. Doesn't look like that's going to happen. I mean, it's August 26th. They haven't done so. Uh, so yeah, I think Boston Scott will be involved a little bit, but man, everything out of Philly is how high they are on Miles Sanders. And so I think his pass catching role, his overall athleticism, his role is a really good fit at the back end of the first round. Um, so yeah, those would be my favorites. And I would add Clyde Edwards Hilaire in there too, as a guy that I really would not mind having either at the back end of round one, although I think he's been going a little bit higher than that. Round one is not where it's interesting. It starts to get interesting as we kind of go deeper here into rounds two, three, four, five, six. Let's get to round two. Evan, who's your favorite target? Forget about drafts on everything like that. Ideally, who would you like to get in round two? So when they have drafted early in the first round, it comes back to you at like, you know, 210, 211, 29, whatever. And I'm, I am, and I'm starting running back heavy, heavy, which I'm certainly willing to do if the right players fall to me. You know, I, I like to let the early rounds, like I don't like to enter a draft with a specific strategy. I like, I like to let the early round, my early round selections dictate what my strategy is going to be for the rest of the draft. And Aaron Jones has been my favorite target at the back end of round two. Early in the process, maybe, you know, May, June, Aaron Jones was going at the one-two turn. I didn't like that. You know, I, I thought he was going to end up on my shy away list, but he's not. He's now he's, he's on my targets list because I can very often get him, get him in the back end of round two. Um, even if A.J. Dillon I, – I understand heavy tight end, uh, touchdown regression is probably in his future. He's not, he scored like, what, 18 or 19 touchdowns last year. I think he's going to be more in the 9 to 11 range this year, but I'm fine with that, especially at the end of round two. And I think that he's an excellent receiving running back. I mean, last year he ran some of the prettiest routes of any running back in the league downfield, like vertical routes. And uh, there isn't much target competition behind Devonte Adams in green Bay. I know that you like Alan Lazard. I like Alan Lazard as a late round value pick, but Alan Lazard was, is a second year undrafted player out of Iowa state who, I mean, he had, you know, he's like the all, Iowa state's all time leading receiver and no team still felt compelled to draft him. That's usually not a good sign for a player. He's, he can be a fine role player, but at the end of the day, there's just very little target competition there in Green Bay behind Devontae Adams. Aaron Jones is a player that Aaron Rodgers is just going to trust. I don't know if Aaron Rodgers is going to trust A.J. Dillon after 10 padded practices. Um, so, no, Aaron, Aaron is not going to lead, lead in touch, but I think going to be very, very productive. I like the offensive line. The team is clearly committed to the run. Um, and so uh, my, my, my backup plan, though, and, and it's really not my backup plan because this guy has been my highest drafted second round player, and that's Julio Jones, who goes in the second round. And I have not been in a draft, I don't think, where he's gone in the first round yet this year. Uh, he goes in the second round virtually every single time. He can absolutely bleed uh, the NFL in targets. I think he can get into the 180 range. This is a team that last year, the Falcons, led the NFL in pass attempts. Uh, and I think that the target distribution at the high end of the target pecking order in Atlanta is going to be more concentrated toward Julio Jones and Calvin Ridley as they change out their slot receiver. No more Justin Hardy, no more Muhammad Sanu, changing out Austin Hooper for Hayden Hurst. Uh, and I think that that established rapport with Calvin Ridley and Julio Jones is, is going to pay a lot of dividends this year. Yeah, I like Julio more than Aaron Jones. And, I, you know, I can't face people complaining about Jamal Williams, about A.J. Dillon. I used a second round pick on Aaron Jones. Why is Jamal Williams on the field? Why is A.J. Dillon on the field? Just got to expect it, man. I mean, Matt LaFleur played Deion Lewis over Derrick Henry. I, I not say I have a problem with Aaron Jones as a pick there. It's just you have to be prepared for it. Uh, in leagues where you can get, and maybe you can do this in some leagues, maybe you can get Miles Sanders or Joe Mixon or Kenyon Drake 
in the very beginning of round two. I would certainly love to do that. But if you can't do that, I actually like to go with one of the receivers, either Tyreek Hill or Julio Jones, two of the NFL's most pass-heavy offenses, two truly unique talents, two guys with a ton of scheme continuity, uh, two guys with quarterback continuity. You know, and we've talked a lot about continuity this offseason. So yeah, ideally, I would get one of those running backs early round two, Sanders, Mixon, Drake. It seems unlikely in a lot of drafts. It starts to get thinner, I think, with Nick Chubb sharing time with Kareem Hunt, uh, with Eckler losing check down King, Phil Rivers, and, and a faster offense to go down to Ty God in a slower offense. But I'm okay with those guys. But I think Julio and Tyreek give me a really big ceiling. And then there's actually some running backs in round three I don't mind coming back with if I need to. Let's move to that round three, Evan. This is where it starts to get interesting and people can start going off the board. People can start doing things we don't like, we do like, et cetera, et cetera. Who is your preferred target in round three? So my preferred targets in round three are Allen Robinson and Amari Cooper. Amari Cooper often falls to the fourth round. However, people do major over analysis, I think, on Amari Cooper. Um, and then Allen Robinson, people are going to be worried about the quarterback situation. He may yeah. fall a bit further. Um, those are, I think, are the, the sharpest picks here. But the third round pick that I have, I think at this point, wound up with the most and makes sense for the running back heavy truthers, which, look, you know, again, I'm, I'm totally on board with going running back heavy if the draft, if that's how the, the early rounds of the draft lend themselves. Because I do know that there's depth at tight end. I do know that there's depth at, at certainly a quarterback and, and at wide receiver. James Conner. Um, this guy was on pace last year with mostly Duck Hodges and Mason Rudolph at quarterback through seven games. He was on pace for almost 1,500 yards, almost 15 touchdowns, 66 catches, and then the wheels fell off. And I understand that there is injury concern about James Conner. Uh, but in a year where running backs are being pumped up, I think that he has, you know, he, he legitimately had, because I think he's going to be an every down back, in a productive offense that returns four or five offensive line starters that is upgraded, even if we only get 70% of 2018 Ben Roethlisberger, huge upgrade on Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. Uh, James Conner is going to be in, in very, very good position uh, to smash from both a receiving and a rushing standpoint, touchdown scoring standpoint. And if you look at the, the turnaround that the Steelers – the Steelers for many years had a lot of talent on defense. They just could not, for whatever reason, I think it was schematics, could not put it together defensively. Last year, they put it together. And I think that they're going to be able to carry over that success. They have a ton of continuity defensively, bringing back the same D.C., bringing back Terrell Austin, who seemed like the, you know, the, the, the straw that, that stirred the drink last year. Um, and uh, so much pass rush talent, so much takeaway ability on that defense they're going to be in a lot of positive game scripts they have a, a pretty soft schedule especially to open the year week one against the Giants come on now um, James Conner uh, I think is is probably my favorite third round running back oh I've taken James Conner in the third round of every single draft that I've done when he's there and yeah so I had James Conner as my play here too since Evan took James Conner I'll give two more I'll say Mike Evans who I think is going under drafted in round three he goes like a full round maybe more later than Chris Godwin and as much as I think that the Bucks are a little bit overhyped and I think Chris Godwin's being overdrafted I mean Mike Evans still 27 years old this whole narrative like Tom Brady can't throw long so Mike Evans is dead I don't really buy that I like Mike Evans as a pick and then I'd say though I'm going running back particularly if I went Tyreek or Julio in round two so if I miss on Connor I'm okay rolling the dice on Jonathan Taylor and this is a guy that Evan and I have both warmed to a little bit more Lately, yes, I'm aware Marlon Mack is there. I'm aware Naheem Hines is there. From a talent perspective, from a scheme perspective, from an offensive line perspective, from a philosophy perspective, from the way Philip Rivers plays, I don't think you can draw up like a better fit than Jonathan Taylor. And yeah, I understand there's concerns about him in the past game based on what happened in Wisconsin. Uh, as the year goes on, I think James, uh, Jonathan Taylor is going to turn into a huge, huge workhorse and almost like a near lock to be a first round fantasy pick in 2021. I mean, I'd just be shocked if Jonathan Taylor was not a first round fantasy pick in 2021. Okay, round four. And this is where it's going to start to get wide receiver heavy for a lot of people because so many running backs are be gone by this time in the draft. I do think that the opt optimal, you can go back and listen to a bunch of our strategy podcasts throughout the year 
throughout the offseason and talk and we can listen to us talk about why this is right and why this is happening this year. Let's get to round four, Evan. Who are your favorite targets? Yeah, actually, for the next three rounds, I'm going to have all wide receivers. Uh, but yeah, and that's that goes to you know why we don't like these running backs that are going in, in this area, like Leonard Fournette and Todd Gurley and Melvin Gordon, because the wide receiver value is incredible. Um, so for the fourth round, I have as the num- my favorite target Adam Thielen, and a real close second Calvin Ridley. I think I actually have them back to back in in uh, the wide receiver rankings that are like wide receiver nine and wide receiver ten. Already talked really about the reasons for that I really like Calvin Ridley. Um, but Adam Thielen is just going to get filled up with targets this year. I think that, you know, the Vikings didn't – they were a run-first team last year. But this season they had – I like the under on their win total, number one. Um, I think that they're going to be playing from behind more. They had to change out their entire secondary. Uh, they lost Stefan Diggs, who's a true difference maker offensively. And so I think that they're going to be in more balanced games, more games with their, where they're playing from behind. If you actually go back and look at Mike Zimmer's history, which I, if, you, if you go into the Vikings team preview, they have had pass-heavy seasons under Mike Zimmer. Um, and Adam Thielen was a guy that came out of the gates in 2018 and had, what, like 10 or 11 games straight of 100, uh, 100 yards uh, consecutively, tied the NFL record, I believe, with Calvin Johnson. Last year dealt with a hamstring injury, has been completely healthy this year, uh, and has a chance to compete for the league lead in targets. I think he's a safe, high high floor, high ceiling pick this year. And I've always been a believer in Adam Thielen's talent. I mean, he was he was a team preseason guy mm-hmm. originally, coming out of, uh, I believe it was Minnesota, uh, Mankato. Yeah. You go look at his workout metric, dude ran like 4-4-2 coming out. I mean, he's a legit athlete, a great route runner can win inside, can win outside, and is just going to get filled up with targets this year from Kirk Cousins. And, again, really like to bet on quarterback, pass catcher, established rapports. There are very few in the NFL that are more established than Kirk Cousins and, and Adam Thielen over the past couple of years. Yeah, and it's funny. I had uh, first on my list Adam Thielen. I had second on my list Calvin Ridley. And so I was like, well, if Evan takes both of those, I'll throw one more in there. I think in some home league settings, you might be able to get Juju Smith-Schuster here. And maybe that's a stretch. Maybe you won't be able to get him here. But just in general, Juju Smith-Schuster is still so young. I mean, this dude was a first-round pick last year. Everything went to hell because of Ben Roethlisberger's injury. But he has a chance for a major, major bounce-back season. And, and I know there's more card competition in there. But, man, Juju is set up really, really well. I'll just add one more thing on, on Adam Thielen. When you remove Steph Diggs, and they're literally running B.C. Johnson at wide receiver two right now. Like, man. Adam Thielen, 113 catches in 2018. That's going to be under threat this year. I couldn't fathom a bigger layup than Adam Thielen in round four if you can get him there. All right. I think we're going to differ a little bit here, Evan. Go ahead with who you like best in round five. I'm not sure that we will. Uh, I have Terry McLaurin and Tyler Lockett. So, I don't know. I feel like I've talked so much about these guys. (laughs) Who do you have? Who do you have? (laughs) Well, I knew you were going to say that. So I actually have a guy that I've warmed to lately, Mark Andrews. You want me to talk about Mark Andrews? Yeah, go for it. Evan was so pissed we took Mark Andrews in this uh, live stream we did with Leone, <laughs> the, the underdog. <laughs> we, he was so pissed we took Mark Andrews. But man, like all Mark Andrews needs is more routes and more snaps to just go completely nuclear. You remove Hayden Hurst, more routes, more snaps available. You remove the foot injury he battled all of last year, more routes, more snaps. You remove Baltimore's just absolute domination, which they just can't dominate teams like they did last year, blowout teams like they did last year. They're going to have to throw more, more routes, more snaps. Mark Andrews yards per route run, one of our favorite statistics, is just completely off the charts. I legit think that Kittle and Kelsey are under threat from Mark Andrews this year. And if not, I mean, you know, you can get this guy in round five a lot of times and maybe late round four, but I mean, you got to get early round two or mid round two to get Kelsey or Kittle. So I think the value is actually better on Mark Andrews here. You don't have as much opportunity cost passing on running backs that you might pass on for Kelsey and Kittle. So yeah, I had DK Metcalf and Tyler Lockett as my favorite wide receivers in round five. But I think if you want to uh, grab a tight end here, I think Mark Andrews is a great, great, great option. Um, Yeah, you don't have to talk for long about McLaurin or Lockett, but just a little bit on your favorite picks there. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that McLaurin, again, just so little target competition. Uh, and PFF has done a great job of pointing out how good Dwayne Haskins was actually over the final four or five games of last year. And that's almost like a contrarian take, even though it is based on actual on-field evidence. And Dwayne Haskins was a legit good prospect coming out of college. He threw, what, like 50 touchdowns or something in his final season at Ohio State. And he, I mean, you, you couldn't really draw up a worse situation for him to jump into last year than what was going on with the Redskins. Jay Gruden openly, like, didn't want him on the team. And now they're changing coaching staffs. And, you know, who knows what their evaluation is of Dwayne Haskins. But I think that Dwayne Haskins is better than public perception has sort of, you know, pinpointed him with or stereotyped him with. And he's got the shower narrative with Terry McLaurin. Again, that definitely plays into, you know, our, our love for betting on quarterback, you know, established quarterback, pass catcher uh, rapports. And then Tyler Lockett, I mean, this is the third straight year we're going to be above market on Tyler Lockett. We crushed the last two years uh, being above market on him. And um, what, one thing that I, I think that's great that uh, Rich Rebar at Lord Reeves on Twitter has pointed out is that even though the Seahawks have reduced pass attempts, which by the way, I think might rise this year if they do let Russ cook a little bit more in quarters one through three, but Reeves has pointed out that, his receipt that uh, Seattle's receivers have overachieved consistently uh, versus their, their target numbers because of the way that Russ plays because Russ throws the ball downfield and throws the ball into the end zone at a higher, much higher rate than almost any quarterback in the league outside of like Mahomes. And so, you know, like DK Metcalf as a rookie, I mean, he wasn't anywhere near the NFL lead in targets, but he led the NFL in end zone targets. Tyler Lockett gets a lot of end zone targets and Tyler Lockett crushes in that, you know, off script scramble drill. I swear they practice that. They must practice that because they are so good at that. Um, and so even though Tyler Lockett's target projection might only be 110 and there are going to be guys in the NFL that get, you know, 160 and 150, Tyler Lockett can outproduce some of those guys because of the way that Russ plays. Uh, and so I, that, that's one note that I wanted to make. Yeah, and I love DK Metcalf also. And for more on that, on the last podcast, we talked about chances of them letting Re Russ cook more and why I think the target concentration between Metcalf and Lockett is so strong. Let's move to round six. Um, people have been following the podcast. People have been following us know that you could have previously gotten Will Fuller in round eight. Now, Will Fuller, I think you probably have to spend a sixth round pick for him. That's who I had here, Evan. Did you have anybody else besides Will Fuller? And, and have you seen Will Fuller go any later than round six lately? No, no. He's not going any later than round six. So that's where he's at. And I, I still am smashing the button on him because I think that without the health concern, he would be a, a two, three turn pick. And so, so now we have the health concern baked in, which lowers his ADP by what, you know, four or five rounds. And we just pounce on that. And again, we're coming back to the established quarterback to pass catcher rapport. Randall Cobb is new. Brandon Cooks is new. Kenny Stills is the fourth receiver. Sean Watts has never been a check down running, you know, check down to running back sort of guy. Darren Fells and Jordan Aikens are, you know, are not going to be target commanders at tight end. Sean Watson looks to throw the ball downfield. Another guy who, you know, loves to throw the ball vertically and into the end zone. And Will Fuller is absolutely a guy that, and he's taking the place of Allen Robinson. Last year we had Allen, Allen Robinson in 28, 2018, or no, 2017, missed the entire year with the Jaguars, was banged up quite a bit in 2018. We were like, Allen Robinson is going to be our number one buy across formats that established the run last year. He finished third in the NFL in targets, caught over 90 passes, was excellent despite bad quarterback play. And Will Fuller actually has good quarterback play. All we need, and again, you don't get zeros when your guy only plays 13 games. You, you don't get zeros in the other three weeks. Like you, have, you can start other guys. And fantasy football is not a game about risk aversion. It's not a game about who can put the most guys with, you know, that have played 16 games in their career on the same team. Fantasy football is about, uh, 
putting together like winning weeks, number one, and how do you win weeks is you have spikes to make up for other guys in your starting lineup, not performing in that particular week, which is inevitable. Um, okay. uh, but Will Fuller is one of those guys who can have those massive spike weeks that can make up for, you know, a bad game from your RB2 or a bad game from your, your you know, the guy that you drafted to be your wide receiver two. And you're drafting Will Fuller at the cost of a wide receiver three slash flex. Yeah. Shout out Blair, Evan's daughter, saying hello to the podcast. Uh, okay, I've said Will Fuller. The only other guy I'm going to mention here in round six, so I've kind of warmed a little bit more to lately, is DeAndre Swift. And I understand that he's probably not going to get more than, I don't know, six, seven, eight, nine carries per game out of the gate. But I think you can see an Alvin Kamara-esque kind of role for DeAndre Swift right away where he gets four to six targets in the pass game. When you combine four to six targets in the pass game with six to eight carries in round six, for a guy who's just a really good athlete, really good pass catcher, has a really good quarterback, I think DeAndre Swift makes sense in round six if you need running back. He also fits with some of these RB anchor builds where you take a running back in round one. You don't take another one until round six with DeAndre Swift and you start get, taking some more running backs later. I think DeAndre Swift fits there really, really well. Another guy seven, that I want to mention in go ahead. round six, and this was actually my backup player in round six, is Michael Gallup. Mm-hmm. Uh, I go back and forth on, between Michael Gallup and Will Fuller. I think that Michael Gallup is safer, and I think that Will Fuller has more upside, but I think that Michael Gallup has a lot of upside as well. In last year, finished sixth in the NFL in receiving yards per game. If you And he missed two games, so if you just go back to his, uh, his two um, uh, uh, rookie year games in the playoffs and you're just looking at his last 16 games, you'd have uh, almost 75 catches, almost 1,300 yards, seven touchdowns. He would have been the wide receiver seven overall in PPR leagues last year. We know that Matt Harmon loves him, um, and he's playing in one of the best passing offenses in the NFL, and he is one of the most undervalued players in all of fantasy this year. His ADP is like wide receiver 31. We have him wide receiver 25. I look at him every day. I'm like, I, I, hope, I wish I could move him up, but it's like DJ Shark and Will Fuller and Dudes that I love that, you know, that I'd have to move him above. And, but I, he's in a sweet spot for sure in the sixth round. Great pick in the sixth round. Yeah. Uh, Evan led his sleepers and undervalued column with Michael Gallup as the cover boy. You can go to the site to check out the rest of his sleeper and undervalued guys. I actually think in some home league settings, you might be able to get Michael Gallup in round seven. Like people aren't that excited about Michael Gallup in kind of more casual settings. And if you can get Michael Gallup in round seven, Evan's going to hate me for this. But I think Michael Gallup in round seven is a better pick than Amari Cooper in round three. I mean, I wouldn't disagree with that. Hey, there we go. I mean, that's that's a one for one thing. I I, I think that both guys are, are undervalued. I, I think yeah. in t- because I think that people are overthinking the offense. They're like, oh, here comes C.D. Lamb. You know, are these guys going to get the same number of targets? I would almost throw out the, the number of targets that they're actually going to get because they're just going to be more. They're pulling out Randall Cobb at 83 targets last year. Jason Witten had 83 targets last year. They're upping the usage for Blake Jarwin, who they signed to a contract extension. They added C.D. Lamb. It's better for the offense as a whole. These guys are just going to score a lot of touchdowns. Yeah. And at the end of the day, I know that touchdowns are not something that we you know, necessarily can – accurately forecast and bet on but if we have a lot of confidence in the offense which I do and I love their schedule too and I love Dak and um you know I think that it's going to actually end up I would worry less about C.D. Lamb pulling targets away from Amari Cooper and Michael Gallup and be more concerned with the fact that the offense is becoming more explosive and they're going to score a ton of points oh their offense is going to be off the charts okay Let's get to round seven. I know we're going to be different here because I know you don't really like the guy that I'm going to say. So go ahead with your favorite pick in round seven. Wait, you know who I'm going to say? No, I know you're not going to say who I'm going to say, though. Okay, yeah. Well, I have actually Dak Prescott here. And also, I named two guys, James White who I think has a chance to dominate snaps in the Patriots offense. And I know that he's been a build as a player that doesn't have, have upside, which is false. All you have to do is look back to his 2018 season and he had um, 87 catches and scored 12 touchdowns. 
And he is the player that is most similar to Christian McCaffrey in the Patriots offense. He's 60% of Christian McCaffrey, but he's the most, he's the player that's most similar. And Christian McCaffrey had his breakout in that 2018 season with Cam Newton. And I think that the Patriots, it would make a lot of sense for the Patriots to play that style of offense this year. And, you know, Sony Michelle, I guess, is, is back, sort of. Damian Harris is so incredibly unproven, although we are higher on, than market on him. But I think that James White could just end up dominating snaps on, on, a, on a pretty good team. Um, and, you know, that, that could be – I mean, in the seventh round is my RB3. I think that that makes a lot of sense. Okay. My round seven – is going to be J.K. Dobbins. And I actually think that right now, and you know, I'm no team watch the tape guy, but people who I respect think that J.K. Dobbins is a better pure runner than Mark Ingram right now. And so to invest that much draft capital in him and then not use him ahead of like, people are like, oh, Gus Edwards is going to play. Justice Hill is not going to play. Like, stop it. And then so if it's only J.K. versus Mark Ingram, well, Mark Ingram's on the wrong side of 30. And so I think J.K. is a better pure runner right now anyways. So to get him in round seven, an offense which we expect to be among the league leader in rushing touchdowns, not just because of Lamar, just because they score so many touchdowns anyways, really like J.K. Dobbins. Again, part of the what I talked about with DeAndre Swift, where RB anchor in round one, maybe another one in round three, maybe not. And then you guys load up on wide receivers and you get the Swifts and the Dobbins, and maybe you, you follow Evan with James White or something like that. And I really like that kind of build. All right, let's go to round eight, Evan. Who is your favorite guy that's going in round around round eight? Round eight, uh, I have Deontay Johnson and Zach Moss. Now, Deontay Johnson, and this has not been talked about often or talked about much so far uh, entering the season, but Deontay Johnson has missed a number of days with a calf injury, and this is – uh, it's going to be a really difficult year, you know, leading up to week one with all these soft tissue injuries, Brandon Ayuk, and it, it's going to be difficult. I, we, we don't know what the deal is with Deontay Johnson, and this, the Steelers have no impetus to reveal to us what the deal is. But I'm sort of assuming that he's going to be fine entering the year, maybe naively, but I love what Deontay Johnson did last season with Mason Rudolph and Duck Hodges. He was a top five uh, receiver among all rookies. I love his return background. We've talked a lot about on this show about how receivers that were dominant return men in college is showing an ability to dominate with the ball in their hands are at an elevated, um, elevated probability of, of hitting in the NFL. And I think that Deontay Johnson is a hit. Um, and, you know, he's, I think he's right there with, he's, you know, he's going to be the primary perimeter receiver in Pittsburgh with Juju Smith-Schuster in the slot. And then James Washington and Chase Claypool competing for that third receiver job. Just a big, a big believer in Deontay Johnson's ability. Um, and at this cost, I think that you know, he's a guy that, and, and there, there's your kid. Um, I think Deontay Johnson is a guy that, especially if Juju Smith-Schuster moves on, Next offseason, they're all coming in. It's a family affair. Uh, what's up, little dudes? Deontay Johnson has a chance to be like a third-round pick in fantasy next year if Juju Smith-Schuster leaves. And so it's the sort of the same concept that you have with Jonathan Taylor trying to get ahead of the curve with Deontay Johnson. Eighth-round pick this year, third-round pick next year. Yeah, Evan's a professional there. I have a five-year-old and a two-year-old. It's like a full-blown daycare over here. Uh, okay, I love Deontay Johnson was on my list for round eight. My other guy that I had as a backup for round eight was Christian Kirk. And obviously, everybody knows what I think of the king of dust, Larry Fitzgerald. Everybody knows uh, that Evan, and I don't agree as much with Evan, but I do think DeAndre Hopkins, there's a lot of risk with him. I would not take him at his current ADP. And so there's a big beneficiary to be had in Christian Kirk, who's an ascending player who I thought played pretty well uh, in kind of a difficult circumstance last year. So if you miss on Deontay Johnson, I'm perfectly fine with Christian Kirk in round eight. Let's go to round nine. I actually think you might be able to get Zach Moss in round nine. You mentioned Zach Moss in round eight. I think in a lot of casual leagues, you might be able to get Zach Moss in round nine. We have spent so much time on Zach Moss. I don't feel like talking about him anymore, even on the last podcast 
we talked about him. So go ahead on your guy for round nine, Evan. Yeah, round nine, Chase Edmonds. And I, I tend to believe what Kenyon Drake has been saying about his own walking boot, uh, that it's not a big injury. But I like Chase Edmonds even you know, long before. We, we moved Chase Edmonds in the top 100 a week before this thing happened with Kenyon Drake in the walking boot because there were indications coming from the coaching staff that uh, Cliff Kingsbury wanted to involve – he called him like a starter in the offense and that he's going to have a, a shot at standalone value. And then if you look at the – if you zoom out and look at the team, the, the Arizona Cardinals, they were an unbelievable – uh, rushing team last year, top 10 in the NFL in rushing yards. No one would have expected that entering last season. They didn't even have a very good offensive line. Their offensive line has gotten a little bit better this year. They were number two in uh, rushing offense DVOA, which we mention often. often. Um, I think Chase Edmonds is good. And Kenyon Drake is straight up unproven. Four years at Alabama, never had more than 92 carries, has never averaged more than 15.7 touches per game in an NFL season. And this is an offense that is going to probably trend toward 30 touches per game from its backfield, which if Kenyon Drake were just to reach the, the, the peak of his two-day career outcomes, you know, he would get 16 of that, and that would leave 14. Let's say uh, Kyler Murray takes five or six of those, and that leaves, you know, what, uh, eight or nine for, you know, another player, namely Chase Edmonds. Uh, so – just a, a lot of arrows, I think, pointing in the direction of Chase Edmonds. He's a guy that I'm very willing to take above his ADP. I want Chase Edmonds on as many rosters as I possibly can. Uh, oh, yeah. For more on Chase Edmonds, definitely on the last podcast, too, we talked about him. My guy in round nine was Jalen Rieger, if it's not Zach Moss. And, you know, Jalen Rieger, the Eagles have no choice but to play Jalen Rieger, who's allegedly been lighting up Eagles camp. I think Carson Wentz, you know, geeks off the street through for 4,000 yards. And so with Jalen Rieger in there with J.J. Arcega Whiteside still extremely unproven with Alshon Jeffrey likely to open the year on pup with Deshaun Jackson on the opposite side of the field, drawing attention and making everybody better as Deshaun Jackson has done throughout his career. And Jalen Rieger, you know, rookie wide receivers are certainly scary in round nine. It's a little bit early, but man, I think it's a new kind of desperation for the Eagles, the wide receiver position. So I think Jalen Rieger more than fine. In round nine, if you miss on someone like Zach Moss. All right, let's go to round 10, Evan. Go ahead. Who you got here? So I have Jalen Rieger here. Okay. But I will move on to my backup, and that is Jamison Crowder, who whenever you post on Twitter that Jamison Crowder is going to see, you know, 150 targets this year, which he saw 122 last year, and the situation is even much better for him this year than it was last year. Um, you will get responses like, Oh, 150 targets for you know 97 catches and 740 yards and two touchdowns, LOL. Yeah, and, and three condoms. Right, right, and three condoms. And look, that's a lot of fucking PPR points. <laughs> even, even for the LOL crowd and, and the three condom crowd. And look, you know, again, I, I talked about him in the, the Sleepers and Undervalued ar uh, article. And I was like, you know, this may feel like a four condom pick, but, uh, and it does. But it's also a smart pick, uh, especially where he's going. I mean, we're not talking about a fifth, sixth round player. We're talking about a ninth, eighth, ninth, tenth round player with a chance at 140, 150 targets. And um, I mean, you read the Jets practice reports that he's getting just shoved hard. You look at the, the history of Sam Darnold. Uh, he targeted the heck out of Juju early in his career at USC. Deontay Burnett, who was a slot receiver at USC. Uh, he was, um, you know, he, he was the number one for Sam Darnold late in his college career. You look at the history of Adam Gates going back to Wes Welker in Denver and Jarvis Landry in Miami has filled up uh, the, the slot receiver with a lot of uh, volume. And then, of course, last year with Jameson Crowder getting 122 targets as a changing teams receiver. Um, yeah, the, there's a, a lot of data points, I think, working in Jamison Crowder's favor. And no, he's gonna probably not going to average more than 11 yards per reception. And he's probably not going to score more than six or seven touchdowns. Although he does have a big touchdown year in his uh, – he had a big touchdown year in Washington. It was like eight or ten or something like that. And uh, so, I mean, he's at least got one of those on his track record. But he's, he's going to get the ball a lot this year. Yeah. 
too many condoms for me on Jamison Crowder. I'll go with a guy with zero condom. Come on. Henry Ruggs. Uh, Henry Ruggs playing Z and slot, kind of the way they used Tyreek Hill, kind of the way Deshaun Jackson's been used in his career. Henry Ruggs is an outrageous athlete who they invested a ton of draft capital and made him the first wide receiver off the board in the draft. I think he steps right in and has a huge, huge role for this Raiders team. I don't like how much target competition he's going to have there from Waller, from uh, Tyrell or Brian Edwards, from Richard, et cetera, et cetera, but uh, from Hunter Renfro. But yeah, I think Henry Ruggs is going to be a very, very good player to get him in round 10, I think it is exciting. I also had Damian Harris here in round 10, but we're monitoring this Sony Michelle story. And I tweeted about it today. Sony Michelle surprisingly returns to practice. Evan mentioned some of what's going on in New England's backfield when he talked about James White, but stay tuned for our take on Damian Harris because we're still trying to uncover information on exactly what's up with Sony Michelle. All right, we are going to go through 16 rounds here, but for the rest of these, Evan and I spoke before the podcast. We kind of agreed on some guys that we're just going to mention here. We're going to tick off a little bit faster. Round 11, Evan, is where I typically find myself taking quarterbacks, and it's typically either Matthew Stafford, Carson Wentz, or Matt Ryan. And yeah, I'd love to have Dak. I would love to have Deshaun Watson. The opportunity cost at those guys is typically not what I want when I'm wasting quarterback picks when I should be taking running backs and wide receivers. For more on that, go to the four mini strategy pods we did with Leone. But I'm more than fine waiting until round 11 and kind of keeping an eye on who needs a quarterback and being able to go Ryan, Wentz, and Stafford. I don't get the rushing equity, and that sucks because that's obviously huge in fantasy. But I get three very, very good, I think, consistent quarterback. Stafford was on pace to be fantasy's QB2 last year at the time of his injury. Matt Ryan is a threat to lead the entire NFL in pass attempts and Carson Wentz as I mentioned over 4,000 yards with geeks off the street I think he's had some upgrade there at least if Deshaun Jackson could sustain health if Jalen Rieger is as good as I thought so round 11 Evan have you been finding yourself at quarterback here a lot a little bit definitely a little bit um Matt Ryan is a 300 yard machine as you know playing a lot of DraftKings where the, you know you get the bonus for that uh Carson Wentz also can be that I think uh, and he's got more rushing equity than does uh, Matt Ryan and Matthew Stafford in this sort of same tier. I don't have Stafford in – I have Ryan and Wentz in their own tier um, because there's a little bit more injury risk with Stafford. Um, you know, we were going off really an eight-game sample with Stafford under Daryl Bevel, which we loved what we saw, but again, it's still an eight-game sample. Um, so that's why I don't have him in that exact same tier with Matt Ryan and Carson Wentz, but we are above market on, I think all three of these guys, maybe a little bit below market on Matt Ryan. Not that we don't like him. It's just, I have Josh Allen at quarterback six and, you know, some people are Josh Allen deniers and, uh, Carson Wentz were definitely above ADP on and Matthew Stafford were above ADP. Yeah. I also think that in some casual leagues, there's a chance you can get Chase Edmonds in round 11. Like, I'm not sure you have to go as high as Evan said, but you need to know your opponents for that for sure. All right, let's go to round 12. A lot of times in round 12, if I haven't taken a tight end yet, I kind of look at that big tier. We've talked about that big tier that Evan has. I think it's tier five of your tight ends, Evan. And I usually end up picking my favorite guy from there. Often it's Mike Jasicki or it's TJ Hawkinson. And so Mike Jasicki, I think Preston Williams is fine. I think Preston Williams is going to play. But still, Mike Jasicki is going to be used as a big slot. And I really like him with Ryan Fitzpatrick. Um, I don't like him as much with Tua. And we'll see how long it takes to get Tua in there. But I do like Mike Jasicki. And then obvious breakout candidate talked about in the last podcast, TJ Hawkinson. You know, just an ultra talent who has been destroying Lions practices all camp. We often see these year two leaps for tight ends. And I know that guys like Fant and Herndon have played well as rookies. But in more common is what happened to TJ Hawkinson last year, where it was just kind of a mess. And then you break out in year two. So yeah, this is kind of where I'm looking for tight end. If I didn't get Mark Andrews, if I didn't get Kittle, if I didn't get Kelsey, if I didn't get Ertz, I'm likely waiting until this tier here of Jasicki and TJ Hawkinson. I'm not sure Evan agrees though, that these are his favorites in that tier that he has. Mm -hmm. No, it's, but it is a good range to start targeting the onesie positions, uh, the quarterback and the tight end positions. I have Chris Herndon ranked above Jasicki and Hawkinson. That doesn't necessarily mean that you have to draft them that way, though. I mean, it's, you know, we're, we're serious fantasy players. When, when you're subscribing to Establish the Run, when you're listening to these podcasts, I don't think you're 
you know, joking around, like this isn't the first podcast that you've listened to probably, right? You know, you're probably a more serious fantasy player and you're cognizant of ADP. You probably have a couple of drafts under your belt. You, you're familiar with guys, where guys typically go. And you can take Jaseki here as your, you know, tentative tight end one. And then you can wait, you know, even a round or two and get Chris Herndon as your technical tight end two, but he might end up being your tight end one. Um, and that's why we like targeting that fifth tier of tight ends with multiple picks when we miss out on George Kittle, Travis Kelsey, Zach Ertz, and uh, Mark Andrews. Yeah. And I would throw Noah Fant into that mix too, although I think you might be able to get Noah Fant or Chris Herndon maybe in round 13 against certain opponents. The guys that I uh, wanted to mention in round 13 were Curtis Samuel and DeAndre Washington. First on DeAndre Washington, you know, we expect him to be Kansas City's backup. It's not confirmed, but I think that there's a pretty good chance that he will. He's competing with Daryl Williams, and there's been some rumors that Daryl Williams might be ahead. We're going to look into that, and we'll get an answer, hopefully, before week one on that. But still, DeAndre Washington's shower narrative with Patrick Mahomes caught so many balls from Patrick Mahomes at Texas Tech. And then Curtis Samuel, you know, I thought Evan made really sharp points, you know, month two ago about how Curtis Samuel was used last year and how he'll be used in this new regime. Robbie Anderson will be the one running those clear out routes that Curtis Samuel piled up all the air yards in last year and had no production. A better route tree for fantasy production than the clear out is hopefully how they're going to use Curtis Samuel this year underneath, creatively get him the ball in space. So Curtis Samuel, you know, Jack talked about getting Curtis Samuel for a dollar in auctions. I think against some unsophisticated opponents, round 12, round 13 is a very good spot for Curtis Samuel. Any thoughts on those guys or anyone else in round 13, Evan? I think you said it beautifully. And I think that, you know, regarding this sort of controversy about who might be the number two back in Kansas City, I don't think there's necessarily a clear cut number two back. I think that Daryl Williams is a role player. He's sort of like a Spencer Ware type of, of back. And if Clyde Edwards Hilaire were to miss time, then there would be a likely committee. And DeAndre Washington is the best all purpose back left standing. So although Daryl Williams might, you know, sort of get like, 10 to 12 early down carries in that scenario, DeAndre Washington might end up playing the most snaps, getting the most targets and be the, the most valuable fantasy contributor. Were CEH to go down. Yeah. Okay. Round 14. And this is a guy, you know, uh, Pecorine turned me on to, and I've been looking at a lot more round 14. A lot of times I'm taking LaVisca Chenault and um, I thought maybe he would come into the league as a gadget guy and maybe he still will, but they need weapons behind DJ Chark and LaVisca Chenault, they invested a lot of draft capital into, can do a lot of things. I also think Preston Williams is in play in round 14, if you can get him here. And I think Alan Lazard is in play in round 14. And, you know, I, I've seen Alan Lazard go round 11, round 12 at times, and maybe that is too high. I think if you can get Alan Lazard round 13, 14, around here with the Chenaults of the world and the Preston Williams, and I have Daniel Jones as maybe a target in round 14 in leagues where you can hold him while his schedule is really bad with a deeper bench. Um, any comments on those guys, Evan, that we picked out kind of in the round 14 range? Yeah, LaVisca Chenault is a guy that I'm going to be, the next time I get to do a, a, a chance to do a ranking, I'm doing like the most consecutive podcast in, <laughs> in fantasy football history right now, right now. Uh, but the next time I get to do a rankings change, which hopefully will be after this show, um, Chenault is moving up into the top 150, number one. D.D. Westbrook is coming out. He's hurt with a shoulder injury. We don't know his timetable for return. But the reports on LaVisca Chenault have been, I would say, overwhelmingly positive. I am totally with you that I had some skepticism on LaVisca Chenault as being sort of like a Cordero Patterson, where the, a team might struggle to fit him into their offense. But Jaguars don't have very many offensive playmakers outside of E.J. Shark and, you know, I guess, uh, Leonard Fournette. So. LaVisca Chenault can be that, that guy uh, as that third playmaker. And there has have been, there's been some talk about LaVisca Chenault opening the season as the Jaguars slot receiver, which is, that's sexy, man. I mean, that's mm -hmm. sexy. If, if we can get, you know, a couple of wildcat carries out of him, which he did a lot at Colorado, um, and we could get, you know, four to six targets from him, he will smash his ADP. And he definitely belongs in the top 150. I realize I'm probably a little late on this, but uh, we're going to make sure that we, we put him in a position because 90% of drafts have not even occurred yet. But 
we're going to put them in a position where if you are using our rankings and you're using our tiers and you're using our projections, LaVisca Chenault is going to be a guy that's absolutely on your radar in the late rounds. Yep. Okay, we'll run through round 15 and 16 real quick here. I want to be clear with all these guys. You know, if you're in a standard size league, round 14, 15, 16, roster churn at the bottom is going to be aggressive in weeks one, two, three. Like we're going to learn so much about these players and their usage. And so a lot of these guys, we want to take upside shots on because if we have to drop them, well, it's no big deal. We want to be attacking the waiver wire early anyways. But anyways, round 15 and 16, I'm just going to throw some names that we talked about before the show. Evan, Paris Campbell, Ian Thomas, Joe Burrow, Teddy Bridgewater. And these are obviously deeper leagues where you might want to draft two quarterbacks or, or whatever. I would be okay in a deeper league, I guess, with Burrow or Teddy, but probably not. I would probably want to stick in that Wentz, uh, Ryan Stafford type tier. But yeah, Paris Campbell, I've been taking a lot late as a flyer. And Ian Thomas, you know, if you miss on that Fant, Herndon, Jasicki, Hawkinson types, I think Ian Thomas is fine. And Joe Burrow is another quarterback who I think can be fine. But again, I expect to churn the bottom of the roster here in round 15 and 16. I know you've been on Paris Campbell for a lot of the offseason. Any comments on him or anybody else? No, I would just say that reading Colts uh, beat reports from practice that Paris Campbell seems locked into the number two receiver role in Indianapolis behind T.Y. Hilton um, when – I mean, and like they've been rotating between Michael Pittman and Zach Pascal as their number three. And Michael Pittman apparently hasn't been showing out big time yet. Not that he's, that he, he's necessarily a guy who's, you know, he's not like a small, speedy guy that's really going to pop off the, you know, pop off the, the field to beat writers watching practice. Um, but Zach Pascal performed really well last year. I don't think it should be surprising if Zach Pascal opens the year ahead of Michael Pittman. That's where the competition lies, though. It doesn't seem that the competition lies with Paris Campbell, who seems to be locked already into that number two receiver role and really sort of fits the bill of a player that Philip Rivers could maybe fall in love with. Really dynamic over the middle. is going to play in the slot a lot, uh, you know, way faster than Keenan Allen. But, um, you know, a guy that is going to be a high percentage target. The, the Colts are not going to have a ton of pass attempts this year. They're going to be, I think, the top five team in terms of rushing attempts. Uh, but Paris Campbell is absolutely a game breaker. And that was his game. I remember watching him coming out of Ohio State. And uh, I just – the first thing I watched about him was like his top – his uh, 20 most explosive plays from his final season at Ohio State. They were all drag routes and um, just all kind all, – all stuff that occurred like within five yards of the line of scrimmage. And um, – and I think that's how the, the Colts, if you watch that, the, the, the draft, uh, the YouTube show on the Colts, the year that they drafted Paris Campbell in 2019, Frank Reich, when they got him, Frank Reich was like jumping out of his chair. He actually wanted to take, they had two second round picks that year. The other second round pick that they used earlier, Chris Ballard wanted, I think I want to say it was Ben Bonagu out of TCU, like a linebacker or like an edge. And then, and I think Frank Reich, you could see Frank Reich, he's like sitting in his chair, disappointed. And then they had another second round pick later in, in, the, in the round and they got Paris Campbell. And Frank Reich like jumped out of his chair, like, yes! He like high-fived everybody in the room. And um, this is the, I mean, Paris Campbell had horrible inju injury luck last year, but legit, really good prospect. Um, and I think he's locked into a starting role. Yeah. I know a lot of people like banged on Paris Campbell for only running one route at Ohio State. Maybe he could have done more. They just didn't ask him to. You know what I mean? Like I wouldn't penalize the guy just for saying that. Uh, I wouldn't say he can't do it just because he wasn't asked to do it. Oh, and that happens all the time to yeah. with Ohio State receivers because they use them in very specific roles. That happened to Terry McLaurin. He went in the third round. Uh, it happened to even Michael Thomas. He went in the second round. You know, these guys obviously deserve to be drafted much higher than they were. Um, and that's because they, yeah, you, when, you know, the scouts can't look on tape and be like, oh, we can see him running a vast array of routes. They use them in specific roles. And they won a ton of games at Ohio State, and they were great players in those roles. Yeah, for sure. Okay. We've said it all. Hope you guys enjoyed this round by round target podcast. Again, if you have a draft coming up, I don't think there's any way we wouldn't be able to help you dominate your competition. It's just $35 is our draft kit. Comes with a $25 coupon. Also, 
to use in any FFPC league. Again, if you have a draft coming up, head to establish the run. Dot com pick up the draft kit we've been working on it for five months and we are continuously updating it to stay up to date with all the news that we are finding coming out of training camp so for evan for producer luke i am adam good luck in your drafts if you have one this weekend